We're in a very interesting moment in American politics and, and in the world today. One of the interesting things about being a speaker is that people are often giving you passionate advice about what you should say. So while at dinner, um, uh, before I came up here, someone said, make sure you say something about Obama's economic policies. And uh, so I thought I might begin um, somewhat obliquely to address this topic by, by telling you a story. And the story actually involves uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, Churchill was scheduled to deliver a major address in the parliament. But since it was going to be a long one, uh, 50 minutes uninterrupted, uh, Churchill thought that before going up to the podium, it might be prudent for him to, to make an, a stop in the men's room. Uh, and so in goes Churchill, and he positions himself at a particular spot. And actually looking in the audience, I see several women present, so I need to explain an element of men's room etiquette. Uh, and that is that if you are in the men's room positioned at a particular spot and someone else comes in, it is considered impolite to come and stand right next to you if there are other spots available. So here's Churchill. Uh, and uh, who should walk in but his political rival, Clement Attlee. And what does Attlee do? But he comes right up to Churchill and stands right next to him. At which Churchill moves three spaces down. To which Attlee looks over and says, uh, My, my, Winston, uh, are we being a little modest? To which Churchill replies, uh, not, not at all, Clement. It's just that whenever you see something that is private, large, and working well, you want to nationalize it. <laughs> this, this concludes my analysis of Obama's economic policies. <clears throat> um, now, one of the most interesting things about our debate today is the way in which issues that seem to have been debated, uh, seem to have been settled in the 20th century, are back with us again. Uh, I should kind of confess I'm, I became interested in politics as a fre freshman at Dartmouth. This was in the early 80s. It was the era of Reagan. And if I think about Reagan, uh, what Reaganism represented was a kind of challenge to the dominant idea of the 20th century. The dominant idea of the 20th century was, quite simply, collectivism. Uh, for Reagan, collectivism manifested itself in two forms, the Soviet empire abroad and a kind of promiscuously expanding welfare state at home about something that had begun with the New Deal, continued with the Great Society. And, and Reagan saw his career as mobilizing against this kind of expanding collectivism. When I came to America, this was, I came to America as an exchange student in the late 70s. The public ethos in the United States had been set several years earlier by John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy said, if you are young, if you are idealistic, if you care, do what? Join the Peace Corps. Become a public servant. And the idea was that the public servant is a kind of embodiment of American idealism. Reagan challenged this. For Reagan, it wasn't the public servant. In fact, Reagan called him the bureaucrat. For Reagan, it was not the bureaucrat. It was really the entrepreneur who was the true American hero, the entrepreneur who t takes a grain of sand and makes it into silicon. The entrepreneur is the embodiment, if you will, of American greatness. And Reagan had a rather dim view of the bureaucrats. In fact, even when Reagan was president, he showed an almost studied uh, disinterest in large sections of the bureaucracy. At one point, he was at a 
he saw one of his own cabinet secretaries, Sam Pierce, and Reagan didn't recognize the guy. Uh, he was at a meeting of big city mayors and he goes, how are things in your city, Mr. Mayor? And many people were outraged. They go, how can the president not recognize his own cabinet secretary? But I think from Reagan's point of view, this guy was the head of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And I think for Reagan, that was a bit of a rat hole of public policy. Reagan felt, if I go in, I'll never come out. So Reagan focused just on a few large issues, but really he was against the idea of collectivism. And in some ways, Reaganism was successful. The Soviet empire imploded, collapsed. The Berlin Wall came down. Even Bill Clinton uh, ceremoniously announced the era of big government is over. Uh, in every empirical comparison, uh, between a capitalist and a socialist economy, the socialist economy proved to be a disaster. North Korea versus South Korea, for example. And uh, all of this appeared to be a done deal. In fact, it appeared that capitalism was going to be not only victorious, but victorious in a more decisive way than had ever been the case before. Here's why. In the past, for example, around the time that Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, capitalism faced a formidable opponent, which was mercantilism, managed trade, and capitalism won that debate. But in the past, every time capitalism won a debate, some new opponent would come into the field and say, yes, but we are better. So capitalism would knock out one guy from the field, but another guy would show up to do battle all over again. At the end of the 20th century, we had a unique situation where capitalism had defeated its last opponent, leaving no challengers in the field. In fact, in the late 1990s, I would sometimes go to these rallies, uh, demonstrations at trade meetings and so on, protests against globalization in which you would have a lot of uh, disheveled student types with slogans, down with capitalism. And somewhat affably, I'd walk up to these guys and tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, down with capitalism, right on, but up with what? What's, what's your alternative? And they would usually give you a suitably dazed expression. Uh, but what they were trying to say is we're against capitalism, but no, we're not really for anything. We don't have an alternative ideology. We just think this is a bad thing. So the critics of capitalism didn't have a rival system or ideology to propose. Capitalism, in that sense, seems to, have, seems to have swept the field. But here we are, just a decade or so later, and it appears like we have that deja vu feeling that these debates are all back with us in a really big way. And in some senses, it appears like we're having these debates all over again. I want to suggest, however, that this is not so that we have actually seen a rather interesting and decisive shift in the nature of the debate. In a way, it's true, capitalism has won the economic debate. The old debates of the 20th century were debates about efficiency. The Marxists, if you read their works, were insistent that Marxism and socialism would be better ways of creating prosperity than capitalism. That argument is actually over. You don't hear that anymore. But what we have now seen is a decisive shift in which capitalism, which was previously attacked on the grounds of efficiency, is now attacked on the grounds of morality. So we are now seeing a new moral debate about capitalism in which from the left, but also from the right, capitalism is indicted uh, for Producing efficiency, yes, but doing other horrible things to our values or our society or our community or our environment and so on. This is, in that sense, a, a bit of a new debate. It's new in its manifestation, although it's a debate that in some senses could easily be anticipated. It could be anticipated because the moral conundrum of capitalism is there from the very beginning. You see it right there in Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. Uh, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations is the classic 
defense of capitalism. But if you read it, you discover somewhat startlingly that it is a defense of capitalism, but it is not a defense of capitalists. In fact, if you look at the businessman, uh, the merchant, uh, the trader, Adam Smith takes a rather low view of that guy. For Adam Smith, the businessman, the merchant, is a bit of a low, selfish guy. He says, you can't leave businessmen alone in the room, because the moment you do, they start conspiring to fix prices. So in Adam Smith's view, you've got some rather dubious characters at the heart of the capitalist enterprise, but Adam Smith says not to worry, because through the invisible hand of competition, the individual selfishness or self-interest of these entrepreneurs will, in a sort of uh, uh, almost magical form, uh, work itself to the general material betterment of society. So Adam Smith saying is competition will keep these dubious characters honest. Co competition will uh, work to the better of everyone. Uh, and this is a defense, as I say, of the system, capitalism, free markets, but not really a defense of the entrepreneur. I think that, uh, I remember uh, years ago, I saw an interesting uh, episode. It was a television show with John Stossel, uh, who was then at ABC News, uh, and he was interviewing uh, Ted Turner. And Ted Turner, you might remember, had announced that he was donating a billion dollars to the United Nations. And John Stossel said to him, he said, you probably fancy yourself to be a wonderful guy, but the truth of it is you're giving away all this money, and how do you know it's going to do a whole lot of good? You're, how do you know you're not putting this money down a, down a black hole? What if you were instead to, to, to use this money to invest in your businesses, create more jobs, um, maybe make CNN a little more competitive uh, in the market? Uh, how do you know that you wouldn't do more good that way than by giving it away? And if you watch the interview, it was very interesting because Ted Turner became visibly incensed and actually got up and began to ran, run off the set, followed by Stossel. <laughs> and when Stossel finally caught up to him, he turned to, to Stossel and he said uh, very uh, petulantly, he said, I am just trying to give back to the community. And watching it, I'm thinking, well, how long have you been taking from the community? In other words, when you hear people say, I'm giving back, is almost a built-in assumption that what they do on an everyday basis is a form of legalized theft. They have, in some senses, committed the sin of making money for which they now have to atone through the repentance of philanthropy or giving back. But if what you were doing was in the first place socially productive and good for society, you, you could still be philanthropic, but you wouldn't have this penitential tone because you'd be doing more good uh, uh, on top of the good you're already doing by creating jobs and businesses and so on. So the point I want to make is that we are in a situation in which even the capitalists themselves have a kind of moral anxiety about the legitimacy, particularly the ethical legitimacy, of what they do. Now, is this notion, uh, is this anxiety justified? The really odd thing is that one of the leading defenders of capitalism, Ayn Rand, author of Atlas Shrugged and a number of other books, takes the critiques of capitalism and refutes them by agreeing with them. And so, for example, one of the big critiques of capitalism is the businessman is a greedy, selfish bastard. What is Ayn Rand's response? True as charged. Rand wrote a book called The Virtue of Selfishness, in which she basically says, you accuse us of being selfish, and so we are. What of it? Selfishness is a virtue. And so what you have here is a peculiar dynamic in which the critics and the defenders of capitalism appear united in the affirmation that the system is based, you might say, ultimately on self-regarding uh, drives and not on community or the welfare of others. Certainly by any conventional sense of morality, it seems a rather immoral or at least dubious system. 
And yet, in a way, if you have any exposure to entrepreneurs, you notice something rather striking about them. And I think that with, in my experience, with the possible exception of the clergy, and that's only a possible exception, entrepreneurs more than anyone else I can see spend most of their time and effort anticipating uh, and attempting to meet the wants and needs of other people. In other words, whatever the, uh, whatever the initial drive that tells someone to start a business, most of the entrepreneurs' everyday hours are spent thinking about, how do I serve my customers better? Now, this may seem to be uh, an unexceptional uh, quality, except you go to any other field and you see how extremely rare it is. Here we are. We are in academia. I've been in academia most of my life. When I was at the American Enterprise Institute, I would stroll down the hallway, and I saw one of my distinguished colleagues writing a book. I walk in. I said, oh, what are you writing about? He says, I'm writing an indispensable book on Gnosticism in the fourth century. I said, well, it's a rather striking topic. Um, has it occurred to you who wants to read a book about Gnosticism in the fourth century? And he said, no. It actually hadn't occurred to him. This is a subject that interested him intellectually. And so he decided to write about it. And by the way, as an author, I'll tell you, most authors work that way. What am I interested in? The French Revolution. I'll write a book on it. I'll put it out there. And then I'm going to be mighty upset if there aren't very long lines outside Barnes and Noble and borders of people lining up to buy my book. But if you ask me in advance, did I think about the potential audience for the book? No. This is what interested me. In other words, by and large, the intellectual is driven by his or her own interests, devoting very little attention to what potential customers there might be for this interest, who might want to read or learn about any of this. And if you want to know why classroom lectures are so terrible, I've given you part of the explanation. The intellectual is fascinated, in a sense, with himself. You simply happen to be in the room, collecting a grade at the end of it. But think about it, the, the entrepreneur could never work that way. The entrepreneur is selling soap or the iPad uh, or a television program. The entrepreneur has got to ant not only satisfy, but really the best entrepreneurs have got to do something very remarkable indeed, to anticipate the wants and needs of people who don't even know that they have those wants and needs. The most successful products are not products that are on the market in which you're making a product better. That's ordinary entrepreneurship. The Japanese take a car and they go, Americans, when they drive to work, they like to have large uh, portable cups of coffee and they like to deposit the coffee just where their hand happens to fall. So there should be a coffee cup holder in precisely that spot. That's satisfying a human need at a very basic level. But here's something more dramatic. Take something like the iPhone, or even earlier, the Sony Walkman. Sony Walkman was invented by Akio Morita of Sony. Morita would go to the beach, and uh, unruly teenagers would show up with loud boom boxes, driving him and his family nuts. And so Morita said, this is really annoying. Can't those people keep their music to themselves? So he rounded up some of his car engineers and he said to them, can't you find a way to take this music and attach it to some kind of node and stick it into people's ears so they're the only ones who hear this kind of nonsense? The rest of us won't be disturbed. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that not a single person wrote a letter to Morita saying, I want a Sony Walkman. I want an iPhone. No. The entrepreneur thought of it, anticipated it, built it, sold it, and then, if you will, the, the market came to buy it. The customer was the last man to show up, if you will. So the point I want to make here is that even if the driving motive of the entrepreneur is self-interest, I want to make money, I want to support my family, I want to build a legacy, the operational activity of entrepreneurs, if they're going to be successful, is they've got to they've go a long way 
in thinking about what other people want and what's going to make other people happy. Now, where I'm going with all this is that people say capitalism is based on greed. But is the greed in capitalism? No. The greed is, in fact, in human nature. Greed is a bit like lust. It is built into the human frame. And so society has got to figure out what to do with these things. Historically, there have been some efforts to root them out. Those have proven somewhat impractical. And so what capitalism tries to do is to steer self-interest or greed in such a way that it serves the material welfare of society. To put it somewhat differently, capitalism civilizes greed in much the same way that marriage civilizes lust. Marriage tries to take lust and steer it to the mutual love, the raising of children, uh, and society is better off. And capitalism tries to take greed, a given, and channel it in such a way that it serves, if you will, the welfare of society. I've spoken a little generally about the entrepreneur. These debates as we're having them today, however, are not conducted in these abstract forms. They're conducted in very concrete debates about financial regulation and health care and so on. I must say that these debates, if you watch them carefully, are, are, are actually uh, a, a debates of low comedy. I was watching the health care summit, which some of you might have seen with Obama in the starring role. And actually, the Republicans, by the way, were part of the comedy because, for example, both sides agreed emphatically that insurance companies were being just downright terrible in not providing insurance to people who have pre-existing conditions. And this was an article of, as I say, bipartisan agreement. This issue of bipartisanship, I mean, you shouldn't get me started on this. Um, because one of the challenges I have as living in America is explaining to my family in India what's going on in American politics. It's really very hard to do. My parents said, can you explain American politics? I can't do it. So finally I said to my mom, I said, Mom, let me, let me give you a summary. We have two parties in America. We have a stupid party and we have an evil party. I said, um, I happen to be a proud member of the stupid party. I said, once in a while in this country, we do things that are both stupid and evil, and those things we call bipartisanship. <laughs> but that aside, back to the issue of pre-existing conditions. Imagine the following conversation between me and my insurance company. Hello, insurance company, it's Dinesh. Dinesh, great to hear from you. What can we do for you? Well, you know, I actually would like to purchase some fire insurance for my house. Wonderful, we've got some great policies for you. How's your house doing? Well, uh, not so good. It's, um, it's actually on fire. <laughs> it's on fire? Yeah, it's on fire right now. Things almost burned to the ground. Well, shouldn't you be calling the fire department? Well, it's too late for that. The house is pretty much a goner. What I really need is a lot of cash to pay for me to replace it and have a new house. Well, the insurance company is going to say, well, you dummy, that's not what insurance is. Insurance is a bunch of guys whose houses are not currently on fire, putting money into a pot so if somebody's house happens to burn in the future, we'll have some money to be able to replace it. So this gives you a little bit of an idea of the idiocy that now passes for public debate in our society, unchallenged in the arena of intelligent discussion. Now, to me, these are really not debates about abstractions because at the root of it, what they are getting at is what kind of society we're trying to be in America. Now, when we think about America, we often think about the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, um, and uh, various uh, structures of government, and so on. Those are important. They're important because if you look at what distinguishes America from the rest of the world, it is that America was set up as an entrepreneurial society. If you, read the, if you read the Constitution before the Bill of Rights was added, ignore the Bill of Rights, look only at the original Constitution, how many rights 
are mentioned in the original Constitution? And the answer is none, or actually only one. And that is the right to have patents and copyrights. So for the founders, the idea of property rights and to being able to own property and, and trade, this was fundamental. This was part of the original structure. The other Bill of Rights were appended later, and there was some debate over whether they were needed at all. So America is an entrepreneurial society, very different than Europe, by the way, and very different than most of the world. In fact, historically, the entrepreneur has been looked down upon, has been reviled, has been scorned as a kind of very low, dubious character. Um, Confucius says that the wise man knows how to be honorable. The low man engages in trade. In India, in the Indian caste system, the merchant is pretty close to the bottom. You have the, the, the Brahmin or the priest at the top, the warriors and kings and the aristocrats come next, and you go on down the line, and one step above the hated untouchable is the entrepreneur. And so it has been in many cultures. In fact, in Islam, I was reading a, a wonderful essay by the, Islamic, the medieval Islamic historian Ibn Khaldun, and he's discussing the question of which is more, which is more um, wonderful, which is more praiseworthy to become wealthy through trade or to become wealthy through looting. And he says, quite obviously, it is much better morally to become wealthy through looting. Why? Because he says looting is very manly. If you're going to loot someone's stuff, you've got to show up at their village, you've got to beat up their men, you've got to engage in man-to-man -man combat, and then, if you will, you've got to take their stuff. Trade, he says, appeals to what is sort of effeminate and base in human nature. Now, I only say all this to show you that what the American founders were doing is producing a radical moral inversion. They were taking the entrepreneur from the bottom of the heap and putting him on the top. They were trying to create a, a different kind of society based on mobility, based on opportunity, and this is the America that I wanted to come to uh, growing up as I did in India. Now, even today, a lot of people will say, well, yes, but you know, the European societies are, are better. They, they offer a much more expansive safety net if you need to have your hip replaced if you are worried about your retirement, uh, if you get sick, uh, you'll be better provided for in Holland or in Germany or in England. And it's true, European societies do offer more security, but America offers more opportunity and more mobility. If you are a guy starting out at the bottom, you have a better chance of making it to the middle or the top in America than you do in just about any European country. Even now, if you meet a rich guy in Germany or France, it's a 50-50 bet that he or she comes from a rich family. In other words, success stories do exist, but they're episodic. People comment on them because they're unusual. In America, success stories are so numerous that we've really stopped counting. In fact, it's very normal in an American family to have one guy who is a vice president of Oracle Software and his brother is pumping gas at the local gas station. That's not unusual. Same family, same gene pool, same social conditions, but radically different outcomes. Not long ago, I, when we think of America, we often think of economic opportunity. And in fact, we think immigrants come to America for economic opportunity. And that's true, but it's not the whole truth. In fact, I grew up in a middle-class family. My dad was uh, dead now, but he was an engineer, my mom a school teacher. And I grew up without great luxuries, but not lacking for anything. So if you were to ask me, Dinesh, materially, has your life been better in America? I would say, yeah, it has. But it is not a radical difference. Actually, my life has changed more in other ways. I asked myself, what would my life have been like if I never came to America, if I stayed in India, for example? Well, 
If I stayed in India, the chances are I would have lived my whole life uh, in a 10-mile radius of where I was born. I would have, without a doubt, have married a girl of my identical uh, caste and socioeconomic and cultural background. I would almost unquestionably have become an engineer like my dad, or a doctor like my grandfather, or some kind of a computer programmer. I would have a whole set of views and opinions that could be predicted in advance. So what am I saying? Well, what I'm saying is that my destiny would to a large degree have been given to me. Not, not that I would have no choice, but the choice is within confined parameters. Now I come to America and I discover something quite startling. I discover suddenly that to a degree that is not possible in any other country and to a degree I would have thought impossible, I find in America I am the architect of my own destiny. In other words, in America, my life is more like a blank uh, canvas, uh, and I am the artist. In, in America, your destiny isn't given to you. It's, it's constructed by you. So your major decisions in life, where to live, who to love, who to marry, what to become, what to believe, these are decisions made by you, the individual, for yourself. So this, to me, is the core idea of America. It's the idea, you may say, of the self-directed life. And if, if, if we see a problem with the idea of this massive and encroaching government, it is ultimately that what it is encroaching on is precisely that freedom to make your own way, to shape your own destiny. It is ultimately substituting the directed, the choreographed, the planned, the overseen life from the self-determined life. Now, again, this action is defended on the grounds of virtue. It's making people more compassionate. It's making people do right. If you listen to Obama's rhetoric, that's the underlying idea. We want to call people to something higher. But I want to suggest to you that this something higher, far from being an affirmation of virtue, is actually a complete evisceration of it for the following reason. Imagine if I'm walking on the riverbank and a guy comes up to me and he goes, hey, I see you're eating a sandwich and let's make it a really good sandwich. It's a Subway footlong sandwich that I bought for five bucks, having watched one of the recent commercials on this subject. And here I am with this massive, gigantic Subway sandwich. And a guy comes and says, I'm hungry, can, can you give me half your sandwich? And so I do. Well, this is a very nice transaction. Why? First of all, I've done something good. That deserves some moral credit. The person receiving has a sense of obligation. Wow, that was really nice of you, Dinesh. And, and I could really use the sandwich, and maybe someday if I'm in a better position to help some other guy, I'll do that. So it's a transaction that seems to be good all the way around. Good for me, good for the beneficiary, good for society. Now let us modify this example slightly. Here I am walking on the riverbank with this very same Subway sandwich, and a guy comes up and says, I'm hungry, Dinesh, give me your sandwich. This time, however, I say, no, or I say, nothing. And who should show up at this moment on a white horse but President Obama, who dismounts his horse, comes running up to me, puts a gun to my head, and says, hand over your sandwich. And so I do. And Obama splits the sandwich in half, returns one half to me, and gives the other half to the hungry guy. Now, if you look at it from the point of view of the outcome, it's exactly the same. The hungry guy ends up with half my sandwich. But now you ask, have I done a good deed? No, because I was forced. I gave under duress. I deserve no moral credit at all. I had no choice in the matter. Is the beneficiary filled with a sense of wonderful obligation and good feelings? No, because to him it's an entitlement. To him, that's a small down payment on all the sandwiches that he's due from society all the way down the road. Society actually owes him more. 
So what I'm getting at is here you have a transaction, the outcome the same, but all the moral qualities stripped from it. So you might say that the outcome is better or worse, but you really can't say it is appealing to the better angels of our nature. It is really a transaction produced, you may say, under gunpoint, without a choice in the matter. And such is the nature of government action in a society. It is the essence of a government transaction to be coercive. It was rather interesting recently to watch the hearings in which people from financial firms were trotted out before the congressman who made such memorable statements as, you people don't know how to handle other people's money. <laughs> Did you actually hear this? And of course the key difference is that in the case of the financial firms, it was it's shrewd investors who have put their money, and if they lost their money, it's partly their own stupidity, and they could always have put the money somewhere else. But this is not the case with the government, in even the simplest transaction. Let's say, for example, one of the first things I learned in America when I came here is that the government has a very wonderful idea for me to save for my retirement. It's called Social Security. The government says, we've thought of this, it's fabulous, it's going to make you better off. Now imagine the following transaction. I say to the government, this is really very thoughtful of you. I really appreciate your thinking so far ahead for my security. But I'm an emancipated American. I appreciate the offer. Thanks, but no thanks. I'll be saving for my own retirement. You don't need to do it for me. I don't want to make any contributions. In fact, I'm not going to. And when I get old, I will rely on private charity. Or I will appeal to family. And if they won't help me, I will die in the street. What would the government's reaction to this be? The government's reaction to this would be Dinesh. Either you turn over your money, or we will kill you. And if this seems like a bit of an overreaction, it's really not. Because the government's point is, we're going to come and charge it to you anyway. So let's say I don't pay. Agents will show up at my house and surround it. They'll say, we're going to take your house. And clumsy uh, defender of my property, though I am, I may reach for you know, an old Civil War pistol and show up at my uh, window to defend myself, at which point I will be shot. In other words, the point I'm trying to make is that when it comes to the government, coercion is the order of the day. But let's step back for a moment. This all may seem a little radical to you. Because all of this is being done in the name of one key principle. And that principle is the principle of equality. In other words, the idea is that capitalism creates wealth but it doesn't create a good distribution of wealth. It creates inequality. If I can think of one predominant idea driving Obama, it's that here we have a pie, and I, Obama, have got a lot of wonderful ideas about how to carve the pie. I don't think it's ever occurred to Obama, how do you make a pie? How do you make a pie grow? Uh, those things haven't really crossed his mind, but he's got great ideas on distribution. But the question we have to ask is, and the basic assumption behind that is that capitalism produces efficiency, but it also produces injustice. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Capitalism is profitable for the few, leaves everybody else in the lurch. And it's worth asking, is that really true? I've looked rather carefully at not only data, but standards of living, easily verifiable in everyday experience, in America in the past 3, 5, 10, 20, and 50 years to see if it is a fact that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And I think beyond dispute, it is not a fact. The rich have gotten richer and the poor have also gotten richer, but not at the same pace. In other words, inequality is greater. But inequality is greater as a result of what? People say, well, we've seen a disappearance of the middle class. We have seen an, an erosion of the middle class, but why? Ha we've seen an erosion of the middle class because the middle class has forked into two. It has become, if you will, a middle class, and now a, an upper middle class, what I sometimes call the first mass affluent class in world history. 
It's worth stepping back to see what we're getting at here. Historically, the great achievement of the West was to take people who are poor and make them middle class. If you look at the difference between, say, America and India, historically, India looks like, India looks like a pyramid. A few rich people at the top, a thin sliver of people who are in the middle, and then the vast majority of people poor here at the bottom. The great achievement of the West was to take this pyramid and make it a diamond. A small number of rich people, a large number in the middle, and then a small number of poor at the bottom. Now, America is moving toward, you may call it, uh, a situation in which the people from the middle are moving up. The number of millionaires in America today, people whose net worth in real terms exceeds $1 million, five million families. In other words, what's happened to the middle class is a lot of people have moved out because they have moved up. They haven't become poorer. They have actually become better off. And as a result, the gap between them used to be the case in the 70s that most people made between about 